Matthew 7 is our text. We are in the series on the Sermon on the Mount. We have finally got into Matthew 7. I think we have spent the last 16, 17 weeks in Matthew 5 and 6 and taking it slow because we want to make sure we understand exactly what Jesus is saying to us as his followers and what he expects of us as his believe of his believers as his disciples. And so this morning, Matthew 7, 1 through 5 is our text. And let me read it for you. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be used, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me Take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I don't know if how many of you have read the book, Gone with the Wind, or seen the movie, but the film version was probably one of the most watched movies in history. The story is known for characters such as Scarlett O'Hara and Ashley Wilkes and Rhett Butler But in the story, there is another character by the name of Melanie Wikes. And though she's of a plantation nobility, she is plain in appearance and often bedridden by ill health. She's especially plain next to the ravishing Scarlett O'Hara. Scarlett could have any man she ever wanted, or any man her heart, her spoiled heart desired, except for the one that she wants the most, which is Ashley Wilkes, which is Melanie's husband. Ashley belongs to Melanie, but Scarlett will not stop until Ashley is hers. In one scene, Scarlett, Melanie, and Mrs. Meade march out of a Confederate hospital, exhausted from nursing wounded soldiers. Belle, a notorious prostitute, steps out of the shadows and asks to speak with them. She timidly approaches her social betters and offers a donation for the hospital. Scarlett and Mrs. Meade, they turn their backs on her and want nothing to do with her. But Melanie, she gently takes Belle's hand and thanks her for the gift. She treats Belle as if she's one of the finest women in the South and kisses her cheek like they were intimate friends. Belle is left touching her face in wonderment that she would be treated with such kindness and dignity by such a fine lady. In a later scene, Melanie's husband is ensnared by Scarlet's web of seduction. Two women come upon them as they are kissing, and the gossip spreads like wildfire throughout the entire region, and Melanie is now the social, um, Scarlet is now the social outcast of the city. A few days later, Melanie has a birthday party for her husband, and Scarlet's husband, Rhett, demands that Scarlet goes. And so he hopes that Melanie will give it to his wife and by throwing her out of the house in front of everyone. So Scarlett and her husband arrive late. She's dressed in a bright red dress with makeup and lipstick all over her face. Her husband insisted that if she's going to act like a whore, she's going to dress like a whore. And she stands at the doorway in defiance. And as soon as she walks in, the orchestra stops playing. The partygoers gasp in horror that Scarlet would be brazen enough to show her face in the house of the man that she tried to seduce. Every eye turns to Melanie to see how she will respond. And a smiling Melanie walks up to Scarlet, extends her hand and says, Dear Scarlet, will you help me receive our guests? Melanie embraces the woman who tries to seduce her husband and graciously escorts her through a crowd of glaring people. When Melanie later dies, Rhett Butler says she was the only kind person I've ever truly known. See, Melanie is the heroine of Gone with the Wind. She's what every Christian is supposed to be. She never judges. She treats even the worst and the weakest humans with dignity and kindness. She never seeks revenge. She even forgives the one who tries to steal her husband. She would take the prostitute Belle and treat her like she's better than she's worth. And as Ashley weeps over Melanie's weeping, she cries out, I don't know how I can go living without a woman of her strength and her character. See, there's no strength in harsh judgment or retribution. French philosopher Paul 
Flame Tree wrote, our judgments judge us and nothing exposes our weaknesses more. Only the strong overlook the faults of those people, the faults of those people around them. And in today's passage on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us how to overcome a critical spirit. In Matthew, first, Matthew 7, verse 5, he says, First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see so that you can remove the speck from your brother's eye. So let me restate Jesus' teaching in one sentence for you to remember. Basically, he teaches us that before you, try, before you point fingers at other people, make sure that your own hands are clean. Before you point fingers at other people, make sure your own hands are clean. See, most of us never take the time to look at our own hands. To put it another way, we miss our own sins because we're too busy throwing stones at other people for the sins that they've committed. After several years of being in ministry, I've discovered that us Christians, we're the easiest on ourselves and we're the hardest on everyone else. And you know what? This makes us look ugly in front of a watching world. There's a singer by the name of Neil Crosby who in in an interview he said, I'm not the judgmental right-wing religious kind of guy. I'm not into that kind of thing. In his mind, judgmental and religious fall in the same category. Neil Young speaks for a lot of folks who sees Christians as judgmental people, specking specters who are quick to point out other sins, hypocrites because they don't love as Jesus loved. Scarlett O'Hara is a devastatingly harsh in her opinion of everyone around her. But every time she's forced to take a hard look at herself, she responds with one of the most famous lines in literature. She says, I'll think about that tomorrow. I'll think about that tomorrow. Let me focus on you right now. I'll think about myself tomorrow. But whenever she harshly judges others, Melanie will gently respond to Scarlett. We must remember that we also have our own shortcomings. See, this is the advice that Jesus would give all of us who like to judge other people. That until we take the log out of our own eye, you can never remove the speck out of someone else's eye. To put it another way, before you point fingers at someone else, make sure your hands are clean. And this morning, from our text, we see Jesus telling us about correctly judging others. And he warns us of the dangers of judging others. And then he gives some advice to us who want to judge others. So let's look at these things. The first thing we see is correctly defining judging others. There's there's probably not a more famous passage than Matthew 7, 1. Christians quote it, non-Christians quote it, everyone quotes it. You tell someone that they're wrong on something and immediately is, judge not. Isn't that what Jesus teaches you, that you shouldn't judge? Judge not. Yet this is one of the most misquoted and misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. And Jesus shows us in their text what judging is and what judging isn't. And five things I want you to notice here. First thing, judging does not prohibit discernment. Judging doesn't prohibit discernment. See, if we declare that something is false or a certain behavior is wrong, inevitably our family, our friends, our ultimately culture shouts back, who are you to judge? I remember offending someone when I suggested that a moral choice that they were making was wrong, and he sarcastically shot back, you Christians are the most judgmental of all people. You don't get to define what's right and what's wrong for everyone else. If it makes me happy, then I'm going to do it. But when Jesus says, do not judge, is he telling us that we can no longer say that some choices are wrong and that some ideas are dangerous or that even that some people should be avoided? Is that what he's saying at all? See, you, gotta, you have to answer, you have your answer when you jump down to verse 6 when Jesus says, do not give to the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Or verse 13 where he says, Enter the narrow gate and don't go through the wide gate because the wide gate leads to destruction and many go through it. Then there's verses 15 and 16 where he says, Watch out for false prophets. They'll come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're like wolves, but their fruit you will recognize them. 
See, we better know the difference between pigs and dogs. We better know the difference between a narrow gate and a wide gate. We better know the difference between um, false prophets and true prophets. We better know the difference between bushes and fig trees. Our destiny hangs on discernment. We need to know what's right, what's good. Our, our future lies on it. Judge not does not mean that we suspend our critical evaluation about what is right and wrong, good or evil, good or bad, healthy or dangerous, of God or of the devil. You can look at it this way. I'm not judging people. We have to judge ideas, actions, whether they are good, appropriate, and if they're worthy of following. You need to be able to discern that. If someone is pulling you down, you need to be able to discern if that person is pulling you away from Jesus or toward Jesus. That's not a bad thing to do. You need discernment in the choices that you make. Secondly, judging demands self-examination. Jesus says that self-examination always precedes judging others or examining others. Look at verse 5. He says, first take the log out of your own eye. Are there any more sobering verses than verse 21 who said, when Jesus says, not everyone who comes to me says, saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus goes on to say that a lot of people will come to him and say, hey, I prophesied in your name. I drove out demons in your name. I performed miracles in your name. And I've often pondered verse 23 where Jesus will say, I will tell them, I knew you not. Depart from me, you evildoers. See, only two things will matter to us on ultimate judgment day. The first thing that will matter is, does Jesus know me? In short, do we have a personal relationship with Jesus. The second thing is, am I an evildoer? Do I live a transformed life? Do I walk the talk that I talk about? Do I, when I stand naked before the ultimate judge, will I be able to give an answer saying, I try to live my life for his glory? That Will I be able to say that, um, Jesus, I tried to do what you've called me to do? Will I be able to see the speck in my own eye before trying to remove the plank or the log in someone else's eye. See, if you want to examine others, you have to be able to discern your own heart, your own life to see, am I truly in love with Jesus? Am I following Jesus? Number three, it does not exclude church discipline. Good shepherds protect their flock. They have to. Sometimes shepherds have to use a stick to keep sheep from wandering away. Other times, they have to risk their lives and beat up wolves or bears or other animals that will try to kill the sheep. Sometimes the wolves will come in dressed like sheep, pretend to be a part of the flock. Sometimes shepherds have to unmask false shepherds. Protecting sheep calls for dramatic measures. It's not a pleasant experience to exert church discipline. I'll be honest, I hate it. It's not the favorite part of being a pastor. But can I be honest with you, if I don't do that, I'm not being a good pastor. Because what I'm saying is I care more about you liking me than I care about your relationship with Jesus. So when leadership and eldership or pastors come to you and say, hey, what are you doing with your life? Why are you screwing it up? Why are you messing it up? It's not because we're judgmental per se. It's because your life matters. Ultimately, Scripture says that I as the pastor have to give an account for each of you. I have to stand before God and say, God, here's what I did with the sheep that you entrusted me with. And I want God to be able to say, you took care of them. You didn't let them wander away and destroy their lives. You didn't let them, you didn't ignore them when they were in danger. So when we discipline, when we correct, when we try not to do that much, but when we do, when we see sins in your life, when we come to you and say, hey, you have to be careful, please understand it's not because we're trying to be holier than you. It is because we actually love you. It is because we care for you. Because your soul matters. 
because your eternity matters. I've had people walk out on me because I've confronted them on their sins. We've had people lost, we've lost people from our church because we've had to confront them for their sins. I don't regret it because ultimately their souls matter. And listen, there might be times when we will have to come to you and say, hey, what you're doing, you're screwing up and you need to fix it. You can look at it and say, oh, they're judge, judging me, and you can run, which is the ungodly thing to do. Or you can recognize that these people care for you and want to see you grow and want to see you mature, and the reason that they're correcting you is because your life matters. So when you are disciplined, it's because we want to see you grow. I discipline my kids because not because I enjoy punishing them, I discipline them because I want to see them grow and mature to become the men and women that God has called them to be. And if they don't grow up to be the men and women that God's called them to be, and because if it's because that I don't discipline them, that's on me. If I let them do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, that's on me. And so church and discipline is a huge aspect that we don't talk about a lot in church, but it's something that you guys need to know that when we correct, is because we love you. When we teach, when we say sin is sin, it's not a choice, it's a sin, it's because we love you. It's because we care for you. It does not exclude church discipline. Number four, it does not negate confrontation. The fact that we don't judge doesn't mean that we don't have a personal obligation to each other. The same Jesus who said, judge not, also said that if your brother sins against you, go and show him your fault just between the two of you. There are times we are deeply wounded. We aren't called to stuff our hurts. Instead, we have to make judgment calls and we have to call our brothers and sisters out. If they've sinned against us, we need to go to them and say, hey, you've sinned against me. It's risky business to confront a person. We may be accused of being insensitive or judgmental or even wrong. And the truth is we might be wrong. So we have to be open to others pointing that out in our own lives. But we must go before wounds become hardened hearts. Paul says in Galatians, he says, brothers, if someone is caught in sin, those of you who are spiritual should gently restore him. See, we have an obligation to one another when we mess up. We need to make sure our hearts are right with God before we take on this assignment, but we have an obligation to each other. We can't let others go down the tube in the name of not judging others. That's a dangerous thing to do. We've got to look out for each other. Number five, it does mean that we will not declare guilt or pass a verdict. A word of caution here. Jesus isn't talking about civil courts or church courts that have been ordained by God to exercise judgment in this world. He's talking to us as individual believers. We are not to sit in the judgment seat. Judges do three things. Number one, they gather evidence. In just legal systems, the rule of evidence are set to protect the accused. Only facts that are substantiated by credible witnesses are admitted into evidence. Defendants have a right to face and cross-examine their accusers. Number two, they declare guilt or innocence. That's what a judge does. He declares if you're guilty or if you're innocent. And number three, they pass sentence onto you. It's a terrifying responsibility to be a judge. Innocent lives are destroyed by incompetent or corrupt judges. But let's be honest. We become judges before we get information, all the information. Most of us don't even follow the rules of secular courts. We make our judgments based on hearsay, gossip, and innuendo. We seldom gather all the facts. We seldom cross-examine all the witnesses. We try the accused in absentia. They're not even given the decency to be able to face their accusers. There is no protection of the accused in the secret court of whispered gossip. And on the basis of Lacey investigation, 
we declare them guilty. And we no sooner pass sentence on them than we step off of the court bench and we become the executioners of our flawed justice. We write them off. We tell them off. We shut them off. We spread gossip about them. And we come up with clever ways to get even with them. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, Judge not before the appointed time. Wait until God comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of men's hearts. Listen, how ashamed we will be when everything that is exposed and all of our screwed up judgments will be struck down by the ultimate judge, the supreme judge. Don't set yourself up to quickly judge other people. Rousseau put it this way, do not judge, and then you'll never be mistaken. What does it mean to correct judgely? It means that you'll use discernment. It means that you will examine your own heart first. It means that you will not declare guilt or pass a verdict. It means that you will confront when you see a brother or sister um, living in sin. It means sometimes the church is called to discipline because your lives matter to Jesus and your lives matter to each other. But Jesus goes on from there to talk about the great dangers that are involved in judging others. See, judging is woven into the fabric of sinful nature. As children... We've learned to do that by watching our parents. Most of us have honed it into a fine art. It's part of our tabloid culture. Tragically, it's the sport of choice among church folks. And Jesus wants us to know that no matter how we dress it up, it's among the most dangerous of sins. And here's why. Let me give you a couple reasons. Here's the first danger of why judging is... Here's the first reason why judging is a danger. Is if you judge you will be judged. Jesus says in verse 1, do not judge or you will be judged. In the original Greek, in the original language, the word judge is in the word emphatic position. Basically, Jesus is saying, judge not. Those who heard his statements would understood Jesus' intent. He's saying, judging is first among crimes. This is a major felony. It's not a minor misdemeanor. This will not be dealt in traffic court. This will be dealt in the supreme court of heaven. There will be no court of higher appeal here. If you judge, you will be judged. That's the first danger. The second danger is this. The way you judge, you will be judged back. Verse 2, it says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. In the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You don't have to go to Harvard Law School to figure out this legal system. The way you judge someone, you're shaping your own judgment. If we are harsh with other people, God will be harsh with us. If we are merciful to other people, God will be merciful to us. Everything we dish out will be dished out back to us. Do you remember in the Old Testament, there was a story in the book of Esther about a man named Haman. Haman hated Esther's uncle, Mordecai, and he concocted this plan to get Mordecai killed and ultimately lead to a holocaust that would have annihilated the Jewish people. Mordecai was seeking to destroy his life, but God, in his sovereignty and plan, destroyed Haman's plan. And the very instrument that Haman planned to use to kill Mordecai, he was killed on. That's a great story of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying the way you judge, it will be judged back to you. So be wise on how you judge other people. And number three, Jesus says, the third reason why you shouldn't judge is because you lack the qualification to do it. In verse three, he says, if you see a speck of dust in your brother's eye, then you try to get that out, but then you don't pay attention to the log In your own eye, you're a hypocrite. Jesus changes the metaphor here from a judge to an eye surgeon. Most of us have never been to law school or medical school. So we're incompetent to play the role of a judge or an eye surgeon. More than that, we don't know the intricacies of the human soul. But worse than that, we have a plank stuck in the middle of our own eyes. We're blinded by our own sins and by our own frailties. We ought to be honest enough to recluse ourselves and step down and not judge. But let's leave the judging and the doctoring to Jesus. See, it's a dangerous thing to judge other people 
Because if you judge, you will be judged. And the way you judge, you're going to be judged back. But beyond that, you don't have the qualifications or the skill to judge or be an eye surgeon. So Jesus says, leave it to me. Let me be the judge. So we've seen that Jesus said it's dangerous and foolish to judge. And then in verses 3 to 5, he uses this wonderful metaphor to show us the absurdity of judging. And, giving, and then he gives us some advice for those of us who are prone to judge others. And he gives us five different things for us to think about. Number one, he says, eyes and souls are easily hurt. In verse 4, Jesus says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when the whole time there's a log in your own eye? You realize there's no organ more sensitive than the eye. The moment a finger touches the eye, it closes up. It's easily harmed. Eye surgeons must possess sympathy, patience, calmness, and coolness when they're performing a surgery on an eye. They have to use the most delicate of instruments. And above all else, they have to have great eyesight themselves if they're going to touch the most sensitive thing in a person's body. Listen, if you're going to handle a person's soul, you're going to touch the most sensitive thing about that person. Souls are easily scarred. You can't operate on an eye with a chainsaw. You can't cut a soul with thoughtless words, mean words, harsh reactions. It destroys a person. Soul surgery requires great sympathy. It requires great delicacy. Only those who are humble, only those who are prayed up, only those who trust are trusting in God should even attempt such a feat. Eyes and souls are easily hurt. Secondly, no one can see through a log, Jesus says. The eye is so fragile, it's so small, that the eye surgeons have to use the most highly technical magnifying glasses. And only when our eyesight is magnified by the Holy Spirit can we see the real condition of other people. That's why we have to spend a lot of time in prayer asking for God's eyesight, to be able to see through God's vision. We can't evaluate correctly when our sin in our own eyes are blinding us to the sins of other people. We don't notice the log in our own eyes, but somehow we see the speck of sawdust in our brother's eyes and immediately want to point the finger where angels fear to tread. In Jesus, It's Jesus' way of saying that we minimize our own sins and magnify the sins of others. Like Scarlett O'Hara, we harshly criticize the weakness of other people, but when our own sins are pointed out, we say, oh, I'll deal with that tomorrow. I'll deal with that later. You can't see through a law, guys. Number four, blind surgeons poke out eyes. Pretty obvious. Blind surgeons poke out eyes. Jesus starts out by saying, it is a danger to ourselves when we poke our noses into other people's business. Do not judge or you will be judged. Now he says, we are a danger to the people that we judge. When we blindly poke fingers into other people's eyes, we can do some serious damage. There are people whose lives have been destroyed by mean words, by judgment calls, by us saying stuff without gathering all the evidence. Do you realize there are children that have been scarred for life, families that have been ripped apart, churches that have been split because we have judged and taken the role of Jesus and not acted with humility and mercy? When I think about operating on eyes, I also think about our principle, do not point your finger if your hands are not clean. You realize when a doctor or nurse goes into surgery, the first thing that they do is that they wash their hands before they get into the surgical room. Why? Because if their hands are dirty, they can pass on a bacteria or an infection to the patient, so they make sure that they are clean first before they enter in. See, when we stick our finger into someone else's eyes, we may not poke it out, but there's a chance that we can infect them and corrupt them because of our own uncleanliness. And so Jesus says, before you do that, make sure you're clean. The world is full of unbelievers today because that, that will have nothing to do with Jesus because of 
hypocrites who try to put our fingers into their eyes without seeing how dirty and messy our own lives were. May we be a people that come to God in humility and say, God, search me first, examine me first, remove my uncleanliness so that I can help a brother, I can help a sister. See, that's why Jesus says in verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Blind surgeons will do a horrible job at surgery. Number four, blind surgeons don't really care about their patients. Almost always, judgmental Christians will excuse their poking around in other people's souls and saying they're doing it out of concern for God's glory or the other person's good. Watch out for people that say, I want to say this to you in love, or I come to you out of concern. Jesus doesn't buy that gibberish. He doesn't say that. Notice what he calls the this, this speck inspector here, those who are wanting to take the speck out of other people's eyes. Notice what he calls them. He says, you're a hypocrite. In short, your voices of concern are bogus. You're just trying to make yourself look better than these other people. Why? Because if you're really concerned about the glory of God or getting rid of sin, you would first be concerned about the bigger log that's in your own eye before trying to remove the log or the speck that's in someone else's eye. In short, they would be more concerned about the stuff that's going on in their own life first before trying to fix someone else. Judging is almost always self-serving. Blind surgeons don't really care about their patients or they wouldn't start poking around in delicate places. Number five, blind surgeons can only operate on others after they first operated on themselves. Blind surgeons can only operate on others after they've operated on themselves. Jesus doesn't say that we shouldn't help brothers and sisters take the speck out of their own eyes. Specks of sawdust can hurt. Specks of sawdust can even blind someone. Even the smallest sins can pierce the soul. You might think your sin is small, but it will destroy you. If we care, we will come to the aid of someone wrestling with sin. But first, we have to remove our own planks. See, only when we're honest with ourselves can we be humble enough to be gentle with others. Only when we've experienced the grace of God ourselves can we give it to others. Only when we see with the eyes of Jesus can we see clearly enough to do what requires something of great care and delicacy. H.A. Ironside was a theologian from the last century, and he said, when our hearts are occupied with the wonderful love of Jesus, we remember that he loved us when we were unlovable, and that some of us are even unlovable even this morning. We remember that he loved us when we were unlovable, and some of us are even unlovable still if he would love us when we were rebellious and if that same love is still filling our hearts today in our sin, we ought to be able to love those who are sinful and unkind and selfish. It is love triumphing over evil. We love because he first loved us. Why was Melanie able to love Ashley, even though he was a weak man and gave in to temptation? Why did she forgive Scarlet and give kindness to Belle, the prostitute? The secret is in her words when she says, Dear Scarlet, we must remember that we too have our weaknesses. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be able to point fingers of other people when my own hands are full of dirt and scars and junk. Because if I do, it just messes other people up even worse. And it's not a good thing. One of my favorite stories in the entire scriptures is Luke. 22, it is where Jesus is getting arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he tells his disciples that he's going to be arrested. And he warns them that he's going to die for them. But even after he tells them all this stuff, Peter still pulls a sword and wipes and swipes the year off one of the servants that was there. You can imagine the scene. There's blood coming down this guy's face and everyone's overreacting and getting nervous and scared. And Peter doesn't listen to Jesus. But what I love about Jesus is that he doesn't turn to the guards and say, you know what, you can take him out. He doesn't listen to me. I don't want him to be a part of him. I don't want him to be a part of me anymore. He doesn't even go to Peter and say, okay, Peter, you've been with me for three years now. 
You've heard me teach this over and over and over again, but you're not listening to me. He doesn't go to Peter and tell him what he's going to do. He doesn't say, listen, Peter, let's try this one more time. I'm going to die for you. There's going to be a cross. There's going to be death. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be resurrection. Yada, yada, yada. Capiche, do you understand? He doesn't do any of that. Instead, Jesus quietly goes off with the guards to be nailed to a cross and die. You see, this is the beauty of Jesus. He doesn't rebuke Peter. He doesn't make fun of Peter. He doesn't turn on Peter. He doesn't judge Peter. And you know what? He could have been justified if he did any of that. Because Peter should have got it by now. He shows mercy. He shows grace. He shows patience with this man that shouldn't have gotten any mercy and grace and patience. And all of this, while he's being arrested to be killed. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on having its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You know, we see Peter and we see Jesus and you see a man that Jesus loved. Jesus loved Peter. And it was Jesus' patience with Peter in spite of his arrogance and pride and failure and sin that caused Peter to show up on Easter morning to the tomb to look for his Savior. It was Jesus' patience with the arrogance and sin of Peter that caused Peter to be a completely different man when you turn to the book of Acts. You see in Acts a man that's transformed by the work of Jesus on the cross, transformed by the love and patience of Christ. So listen, we will never grow in patience and not judging other people until we see that Jesus has been incredibly patient to us. We will never stop judging until we see that Jesus took our judgment. The punishment that we should have deserved, Jesus took it. Because all of us in this room, the only thing we deserve is hell. Let's be honest. None of us in this room are perfect. None of us in this room are good enough. We've all messed up. And Jesus took our judgment. He took our place. He died the death that we should have died so that this morning we don't sit here condemned. We don't sit here judged. We don't sit here punished. But this morning we sit here forgiven, loved, accepted, part of the family of God. There's a danger when we judge other people. There's an incredible danger when we begin to point fingers at other people without first seeing who we were before the cross of Christ. There's a danger when we can see the faults and the wrongs of everyone else, but we're unable to see that we were the chief of sinners that deserved the grace of God. If you're quickly able to find what's wrong with everyone else around you, but you're not able to acknowledge that you were the one that Christ died for, you have not understood what Jesus has done for you. This morning as we come to the table, we come to celebrate what Jesus has done in our place. Not only celebrate, but we come to acknowledge that when we should have been judged, sentenced, and executed, Jesus was judged, sentenced, and executed in our place. He took our place. He died our death so that this morning we can come forgiven and accepted. I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your life. 
Would you let the Holy Spirit deal with you for a moment? Because the Holy Spirit is convicting you that you are one that has a very critical spirit, judgmental spirit, that you can easily find what's wrong with everyone else. Could you, this moment before you leave, would you repent? Would you acknowledge, Jesus, that you are taking his place on the throne, that you are not the judge. He is ultimately the judge, and you don't need to do that. And would you ask him for your help, for his help? Would you ask him to give you grace to love, to be patient? Because as you are loving and patient, you can offer grace and mercy to people that desperately need grace and mercy. I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your motives, your desires. The way that we do communion here at Lost City is whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table as the worship team sings. In a few moments, I'll come back up and we'll partake of the table together. But just take a moment, examine your hearts, your lives, and then let's partake of the table together.